Uh, the topic that I was given to speak about was actually developing curricula in Africa. And, and I wondered, okay, how am I going to talk about that? That's, that's very, <laughs> yes, I can see you know what I mean. That's very broad. So I started asking myself, what is the major issue uh, that I experience as an educator as I, as I try to develop a curriculum? I've developed a, a few different ones, and so the accreditation issue has been a thorn in my flesh as well, because when you develop theological curricula in Africa, for a, in Kenya for a university, uh, you are bound to what the commission uh, wants you to do. And so I was asking myself, what is, what is the biggest challenge apart from that? And since he's already talked about the accreditation issues, I thought, let me talk about contextualization. And I know contextualization is a buzzword everywhere right now. And I'm hoping that through uh, this paper that I present, that we can begin a dialogue and we can begin asking ourselves, what does it mean to contextualize our curricula and how can we best do it so that it's effective? So this paper is meant to initiate a dialogue so that we can talk to it. I don't have any answers, Kevin, where are you? I have no answers. I have a lot of questions that I hope you're going to help me, help me answer. So let me begin uh, with a problem uh, that I think we are all aware of. As most of us are aware, African traditional practices such as witchcraft, syncretistic traditional rites, and polygamy are still rife on the continent. I'm not trying to slam Africa. I'm just saying this is the reality. And even if it may not be the reality in your country, it is the reality in Kenya. For instance, in Kenya, you don't have to look far to find advertisements, usually on electricity poles. Just look around when you're going uh, by witch doctors, promising riches, promising business acumen, promising success in relationships, uh, giving you love portions, uh, giving you um, that thing that will help you get a visa to go to the United States, and the list goes on. You'll see it all around. I think there also appears to be negligible transformation of the society and of the church if the statistics surrounding corruption and impunity on the continent are to be taken into consideration. As one example, I'm going to use an old report by Transparency International uh, released in 2014. It cites Kenya as consistently performing poorly in their Corruption Perceptions Index, making it at the bottom of the list among the countries perceived as most affected by public sector corruption. And if you have been watching the news or if you are a Kenyan, the news reports will attest to this. There have been very many arrests of senior people in having government positions uh, with corruption charges against them. Yet, Kenya is 80% Christian. And so I ask myself, so who is doing this corruption? Who is visiting these witch doctors? It's our Christian brothers and sisters. It is us. Many people are Sunday Christians, or at least they exhibit a Christian orientation when in a Christian environment. However, when they are faced with choices that are inherently, um, I'm sorry, I need to put on my glasses. When they are faced with choices that do not seem to be spiritual, we respond like the world would. Uh, this is particularly evident when we are out of our church or church-related contexts. Beyond that, Africa is plagued by the prosperity gospel. I think that all of us will attest to that. The prosperity gospel is thriving. Self-appointed apostles and prophets are selling salvation and heaven to gullible congregants. Uh, just the other day, I think my husband was telling me uh, that there is a, a guy in Kenya, and I shared it during our meeting yesterday, who is now, uh, he's, the only way you can get to heaven is for him to vet you and ensure that you can actually make it there. This is particularly rife in the African instituted churches where theological depth is often lacking. So what's the situation in our theological institutions? Anecdotal evidence shows that many of the students that pass through our hands often display this dichotomous approach to life. And I think if you think about your students and the way in which they interact in class, you will see this dichotomy appearing in different contexts. Magessa observes that many Christians often display a compartmentalization to life that he identifies as two thought systems. This compartmentalization is what leads to a dichotomous thinking and lifestyle, particularly in times of crisis and need. Magessa's observation is accurate, but I would add that the thought systems are not two, but rather three where education is concerned. Faith and life are the two compartments 
but one's academia or academic discipline also must be taken into consideration. Why? The knowledge and the skills acquired as a result of higher education must themselves shape and be shaped by the individual. I don't know if you've ever heard somebody saying, that person seems to have so much education, but that education doesn't seem to have changed him. And we see that a lot. In this chase for paper, for certification, you can have a PhD holder who is barely articulate, barely able to reason, no logic whatsoever, and you wonder, why didn't education change that person? Well, our behavior shows that while we may know the content of our Christian faith, and even this is sometimes debatable, it has not been internalized. And I think that is where, for me, I feel we need to focus. Why? Why are we not internalizing the content of the gospel? This is not just an African problem, but because I am an African, I choose to address it from my own perspective. The result is that individual believers and churches are weak. Christianity on the continent has lost a great deal of credibility, uh, as my brother said a little bit earlier. This is worrying, and we talked about these statistics, and Jimmy is going to have to and let me know whether I'm right or wrong. Given that this very year, Africa received recognition as the continent with the most Christians in the world, and like I said in the groups yesterday, outstripping Latin America by 30 million believers. And we asked ourselves, what are the implications for global Christianity in the future if we continue along this trend that I have talked about there? So from the classroom to the pulpit and the pews, Theological education in Africa lacks the impact that it ought to have. The question remains, what factors have led to this failure? While it's common knowledge that many pastors, particularly those from the AICs, have, little, have had little or no exposure to theological training, this cannot be the whole answer. I don't think that all our churches are AICs. We have some uh, churches that are more mainstream. So could the fault lie with the training that has been given to the ministers of the church and those involved in teaching in the more formal theological arena in Africa? In other words, I'm pointing a finger at us. Could the fault lie with us, with the education that we are giving? So what I want to do in this paper is just look at three things. Present data demonstrating the need for contextualizing curricula because this is it's not a given that we all agree uh, that this is what needs to happen. Propose a rationale and contextualization model from the Apostle Paul. You can guess where I'm going to go with that. And recommend a way forward. So let's look at the need for contextualizing curricula. I hope, I hope you can see that. Contextualization is of paramount importance in our higher institutions if theology is to become relevant in Africa. Keep in mind that I am addressing that problem of dichotomy. And I'm saying that internalization has not taken place. We are living our lives in compartments. And so this is what I really want to focus on. Kuniop mentions that a proper articulation of an African Christian theology, broadly speaking now, when I, think, when I speak of theology, not as a discipline, broadly speaking, it must be relevant to African issues. So this raises the following crucial questions, and I put them up there. Are the goals in our theological institutions contextualized to the African situation, or are they generic? I don't know how many of you have been involved in curriculum development at a practical level, maybe by show of hands. How many of you have your deans do it for you? How many of you have no idea what a curriculum looks like? <laughs> that's, that's a valid question. But, it, it would be good if you knew whether the goals are generic, or whether they are contextualized to the African situation. Are these goals clearly articulated or even understood by those in our classrooms? I mean, think about your students, think about your institutions. Is contextualization filtering down to the course content and delivery? It's all very well to say we are serving the African church, but your course content has been uh, downloaded from a website somewhere. Because that happens, I have seen it happen. And what about the worldview of the students? Is this taken as an important factor in the curriculum? Tell me, how many of you have ever thought about the worldview of your students as, as you think about your curriculum within your institutions? So just a couple of us. And so we need to talk about that. 
So to help answer the questions raised in this part of the paper, the findings of a preliminary survey, which I did in 2016, about two years ago, of three departments of theology in selected universities in Nairobi will be used. And common to all these, why I used these, is that they were Christian universities, they are Christian universities that were originally seminaries. So the unfortunate trend uh, that was observed in a paper a couple of days ago. So let's just look at uh, some of these findings. Uh, the first thing I looked at was the general goal. I won't give you the whole, all the data, but because this was just a preliminary survey, like a pilot study. The general goals of theological programs. When students were presented with a question on the goals of theological programs in their institutions, respondents cited the following. And I think it's important for you to hear what these students say. Number one, they said, to equip students with biblical and theological principles, as well as skills to impact the world positively. To equip students for ministry within their context, like the urban, rural, mission, chaplaincy, etc. To shape servant leaders for strategic global impact. To shape mission-minded servants, this referring to ministers of the gospel with a burden to reach the lost. And to enable students to identify Africa's challenges and come up with relevant solutions. A few didn't indicate their views, and the assumption is either that they didn't understand the question or they didn't know what these goals were, even though they are actively involved in a theological program. So try that, go to one of your students and ask them, what's the goal of this theological program that you're currently undertaking? So clearly these institutions have largely succeeded in accurately communicating the general goal of their theological curricula to the African audience. Whether this is done deliberately or the students pick it up as they go along uh, is not clear. However, only about 13% of the students specifically cited goals that reflect the African context, which is unfortunate because these are schools within Africa. Evident in this study is that African students in theological programs generally understand why they are undertaking the program of study, but they don't necessarily relate these goals to their specific African context. This may be a major factor in the observed dichotomy. Because if I'm going through an education system and I don't understand how it relates to my local church or to the person in the village or the city that I'm going to serve, then it's knowledge that just sits in one compartment of my brain. And most of the responses of the lecturers were general as well. Um, equipping Christ-centered leaders who will transform the church and society. That was a major one that, that came up. But at least 40% of the lecturers said the goals were of a more contextual nature. So they said to equip leaders so that they can help fulfill the great commission and provide solutions to the problems facing Africa, to offer quality, relevant, contextual, and sustainable graduate and undergraduate programs, to produce church leaders who are biblically sound and able to address contextual issues from a biblical perspective. So while the lecturers themselves uh, may have a more contextually oriented goal in mind, uh, this is not clearly understood by the students even though these goals seem to filter down to the course content, as we'll see in a little bit. What about contextualization of the course content? Uh, that was another question I asked. One of the problematic factors in designing any curriculum is ensuring that the courses specifically address the needs of the target audience. Again, we are sometimes so pressed for time, you download something and you think that that is going to work. Well, at least I've seen that happening. It takes a lot of time to design a good curriculum that meets the needs of your target. So about most students, about 97%, felt that the courses were successful in addressing the needs of the African church and society, which was very surprising to me um, when, when I thought about my own particular experience within that university. And the percentage of the content that is geared specifically for application to the African context seems to correlate to this. About 67% of the students felt that more than 50% of the course content addressed African contextual issues. And for the lecturers, 80% uh, of them said at least 60% of the course content. Uh, that was a very surprising uh, result for me uh, to get, given that observed dichotomy. And then the final thing that I looked at was the worldview of the students. Uh, when students were asked ways in which African traditional beliefs and I, I went for African traditional beliefs because even though we are modernized and globalized, there is continuity with that African traditional uh, worldview. There are certain things that continue uh, to, filter, to filter down to us. 
So when I ask them whether the, the African tra traditional worldview hinders or helps theological education, about 44% uh, said that African traditional beliefs are helpful, particularly in understanding some theological concepts, such as the existence of one God in the Bible. Uh, this concept was likened to the African belief in one supreme being. So they felt it was a good starting point. Several respondents felt that African traditional beliefs help them better understand other areas such as evangelism and the teachings on angels and, and demons uh, as presented in the Bible. An added benefit was the motivation for scholars to do research on how best to reach traditionalists. So they said, it's, it's a good thing to consider our worldview when you're teaching because it's going to help in these areas. A uh, minority of the respondents, about 27%, said that they hinder, and all the reasons that they gave pertain to syncretism, which, which was expected. Some 20% felt it was, 26% uh, felt it was both and. And I think that that, that could be uh, the place where we need to be. It's a both and situation. Not everything African is good, not everything African is bad, and we need to think about that. And uh, you can see the lecturer's statistics uh, uh, there. They kind of gave the same, same reasons. Uh, one of the things that they said helps, actually, is that um, African aspects of African traditions like oral literature, proverbs, songs, uh, were cited as being useful in theological education in helping understand the different genres of the Bible. And I thought to myself, I, I, I never really thought about that. Um, we, are, we have different genres in the Bible that can help our students engage with the biblical text from a position of the known to the unknown. And as educators, that's always our goal to move our students forward. Okay, so I don't know if those statistics mean uh, very much to you because you, know, you, you needed to have the, the bigger picture. But it seems to me that contextualization is taking place in the classroom to a certain extent. Uh, it seems to me that um, our students and our lecturers, to a certain extent, think that the worldview of our students is important, but it's also very evident that our students don't really understand the contextual goal of their theological education. And so with some of these results and some of the confusion with seeing there's so much contextualization in the course content, and yet it's not filtering down uh, to how the students are either preaching or living out their lives, then there needs to be more research. And so an a further study will need to be done, obviously. And perhaps it's a study that can involve this group so that we can begin to understand which way we need to go with our curriculum development. So what I decided to do is to share with you an example of contextualization and implications for curriculum development from the Apostle Paul. Uh, because uh, the questions continue to plague my mind. I'm still wrestling with these issues as I, as I develop curricula and as I engage with different students. I ask myself, what are the other underlying issues that are, might be preventing a transformation of church and society? Is the contextualization not going deep enough? Is it not being done deliberately and consistently? Is it not being done in the right way? Because contextualization is not simply talking about something and then giving an, an example from Africa. That, that is not contextualization. Uh, it needs to go deeper, a little bit deeper than that. And so I decided, let me look at the Apostle Paul, his Areopagus speech, which has been used many times, I know, uh, but I think that it is a speech that really gives us some pointers as to how we can begin to contextualize and move forward with this contextualization process. So Acts 17, 16 to 34 uh, demonstrates Paul's skill in contextualization and engaging of the culture. I'm not going to read the text because I assume that uh, we know that text. So by Paul's day, I think uh, we can recognize the glory Greece had experienced in the fifth and fourth centuries BC was fading, and yet Athens was still a vital cultural center. So if you remember that, that Paul gives this speech while he is in Athens. Athens was full of sculptures, for in Athens, art was a reflection of worship, and the numerous idols on display revealed that the people of this city accepted any and all foreign gods, even providing temples and altars for them. Ancient sources tell us that Athens had more idols and more sacred feasts than all Greece put together. And so that's the context in which Paul is presenting the good news about the resurrected Jesus. So think about your own context. 
you are presenting this theological education to your students, what is the context in which you find yourself? It was well known that the Agora was the place where philosophers debated and presented their views, so it was the perfect place for Paul to begin presenting his message. So we know that as Paul was speaking, he became involved with some philosophers, Epicureans and Stoics, so we know that this was a high-level discussion. Okay, So that's the context in which we find ourselves. And some of them regarded him as a babbler with nothing constructive to debate, while others thought he was advocating uh, some kind of a new god, a strange deity. And so we can see Paul was already coming up against an obstacle. The audience was not open and receptive to what he had to hear and what he had to say. And it's very important for us to keep that in our minds. Then, because the Athenians love to listen to new ideas, they give, an, uh, give him an opportunity to present his ideas in the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus is an important place. It was the, where magistrates dispensed justice and business was conducted. It was also a meeting place where learned men met to exchange ideas. So, kind of like our institutions. So, what's important to note is that no new gods could be admitted to Athens without the approval of the Areopagus. So, Paul knew exactly what he was doing and he knew how he needed to do it. And of course we know that at the end of his speech, uh, some people refused to listen to the gospel. His logical conclusion is that uh, idolatry is ridiculous, right? We know that that speech, that's what he comes up with. Paul's message to them is received by some, like Damaris and uh, uh, the Dionysius the Areopagite and Damaris receive Paul's message, but others do not. And so this is the context that I want us to think about when we think about implications of Paul's message for contextualizing our curricula. Now, for those of you who are uh, maybe New Testament scholars in here, don't fault me for maybe pu pulling the application uh, too much, or stretching the application. I think that there is value uh, in understanding how Paul does this. So the first principle that we derive from this text uh, with Paul is identify your ultimate goal. That might seem to you self-explanatory, it might seem clear, it might seem obvious, but you'd be surprised that sometimes people sit and develop a curriculum without identifying the ultimate goal for that curriculum. They just want to put together courses that they're going to give to the students. The courses are not working together because you haven't identified the goal that then allows you to decide which courses are best going to help me fulfill that ultimate goal? What do you hope to achieve with the curriculum in your specific context? Of course we know Paul did not engage with the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers just for the sake of an intellectual discussion. He had an objective, he had an ultimate goal, and his ultimate goal was to clarify the nature of the true God and the role of Jesus Christ as approved by God, thereby bringing his hearers to repentance and salvation. So everything Paul was saying as he engaged with these philosophers was geared towards that. What's our goal? What do we want to achieve? The ultimate goal of theological study is to ensure that as our students move through the various stages of the educational process, they begin to develop a biblical worldview that is both clearly articulated and lived out in their context because it has, been it has been internalized. I believe that that's the goal that you have for your students. You're not just trying to get them to a point where they are smarter or where they are just better preachers. You want that holistic transformation where they have developed a biblical worldview. An effective curriculum should therefore seek to develop learners in at least four areas if this is to be achieved. And I think we know this, the head, that's the intellectual knowledge, the heart, the hands, and I think I can add something else, the surrounding context. So if in your curriculum you are focusing heavily on the head, forgetting the heart and the hands, or focusing heavily on the heart and forgetting the practical skills that are needed, then your curriculum has a problem. An effective curriculum will look at Bible, theology, history, and ethics, 
for the head knowledge. We will think about the inner landscape of our students, their character, their spiritual growth. We are going to talk about this ministry skills and competencies that they need, but we also need to understand their cultural environment and the way that environment is constantly changing. And so your curriculum must be able to address all those four areas. I think that one of the things that we struggle with in Africa is whether or not there is really an African Christian theology. There's been a big debate in, in scholarly circles. Can we understand theology as static? What do I mean by that? Should a theological understanding or system in a Western or other context be transferred to an African context without regard for the differences in the target context? We might say, no, it shouldn't, or, or yes, it should. But whatever your answer is, you really need to think carefully about your own curricula that you have in your institutions. Because if you take a curriculum from a Western context, as happened to me when I was studying, I studied at Nairobi International School of Theology, and we had a lecturer from Dallas, and he was still using his Dallas notes. I think they had them on yellow, some kind of yellow pad. And he, he still had that. And sometimes we would wonder, we, we have no idea what he's talking about because he's taken that course content and just, he's just dumping it on us, regardless, not even thinking about the context. If we understand that while Christian theology has a commonality throughout the world where Christianity is practiced, there are aspects of our Christian theology that are influenced by our cultural context. This means that theology in a Western context may manifest itself differently from theology in an African context. And what contextualization would mean in this case would be to make concepts or ideas relevant in a given situation. So whatever course you're teaching, systematic theology or your lecturers, um, your faculty, uh, Christian ethics, biblical theology, you have to think about the context of your target audience. So this definition clarifies that the modes of expression of the biblical message are not static but dynamic. An African Christian theology is valid, I believe. So consequently, although some of our goals are, of our theological education are generic and they apply globally, the specific goals cannot be uniformly adopted, but they must be contextualized to meet the needs represented in that part of the world. And these needs relate to social, economic, political, and theological aspects. You have to understand the context in which you are teaching what is happening politically? Your curriculum will then perhaps need to have a course on uh, what? Theology in the public sphere. Maybe I would not need theology in the public sphere if political situations are not coming into the context of my students. But you have to think about what is happening in that environment. That determines uh, how you contextualize your curriculum. The goals of our curriculum must address the African cultural context in both its traditional and its modern embodiment. Sometimes we talk about contextualization and we think we are only talking traditional. We are not. Africa is very diverse. And if you think that it's only traditional, you're going to lose 75% of the Africans on this continent because 75% are under the 35 age group, I think, according to recent statistics. So, challenges remain. Uh, if the general introduction I gave, the dichotomy is anything to go by. But think about your faculty. Encourage them to understand their context so that then they can develop curricula that is really going to be valuable for transformation of church and society. I'm going to go a bit faster now. Know your target uh, context. Uh, that's the same thing. Uh, that's uh, the second point. So Paul understands his audience very well. If you read that engagement with those Epicureans and Stoics, Paul knows everything about them. The understanding of deity, the understanding of anthropology, the epistemological basis. He understands where the Epicureans and the Stoics are coming from. And so for us, we, ask, we have to ask ourselves, who are we teaching and where? I could be teaching in Kenya, but am I teaching in Nairobi or am I teaching in a village somewhere? If that would be a different curriculum altogether. I would have to do things differently. 
You have to, this will help you guide you in developing your philosophy. So does your curriculum have a philosophy? What are your learning objectives? By the end of this program, the students should be able to A, B, C, D. Do you have that? Do, what about your content? Is your content geared again towards that ultimate goal that you identified and the objectives that you have identified? Because if your content is not geared towards that, then your lecturers are wasting time in the classroom. We're just packing our students with more information that is not necessary. What about your delivery methods? Are your delivery methods going to achieve those learning objectives and those goals that you have? And what about your teaching resources? You cannot teach, for instance, a course that's focusing on African ethics and you use a Western textbook. That is not relevant. So you have to ask yourself, how are you managing all these? So both geographical and digital spaces must be considered. I talked about that. They influence the form that one's worldview takes. Because I'm really saying, why don't we get down to the worldview level? We want to shape the worldview of our students. So in order to shape the worldview of our students, we have to get down to that level where we understand how this is influenced. The African audience today straddles rural and urban spaces, that is geographical, but we also straddle digital spaces, such that an African in Nairobi may have more in common, an African youth especially, with an, an, a, a child living in New York, an American, because of that digital space, than even with their parents. So when you're developing your curriculum, you have to think about that. Culture is undergoing changes at an extremely rapid pace. So for instance, let me give you an example. Methods of evangelism in the classroom. Some of your students, older students, may be comfortable with paper tracks, the Jesus film, and so on and so forth. But what about our younger audience? What are they always holding in their hand? The phone. So they need digital apps to be able to do evangelism. So that's what you teach them. I don't know how you'll divide up the classroom, but you have to think about that. That's what I'm talking about, the content and the methods of delivery. Uh, I think that Campus Crusade for Christ had a God Tools app. I don't know whether it's still up or not, but it was a digital app that helps our young people do evangelism. One of the things that I want to point out, and we talked about it, is although secularization has come into the continent, the African traditional worldview, there's still continuity with that. And the rapidly growing AICs attest to the fact that our African traditional worldview is, has not completely been thrown off. So you have to see the worldview of the students as a positive thing, because it's there. You cannot come to the students with a tabula rasa approach and say, I'm just going to dump this content on them. They are taking in this content through the filter of their worldview. And so for instance, you're talking about Hebrews 11. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And some of the students in your classes have this concept of the divinization of their ancestors because you don't know which con context you're in. The continuity between the ancestors and us. And that's what they're thinking about. I've asked students this in class and they've told me, are these Christians are sitting somewhere like in an arena watching us. I don't know whether you've had, maybe it's only Kenyans who have a poor theology. But this is a very real issue. And we have to be able to engage the worldview of our students. And that's the next point that we're going to look at. But I wanted us to just take a look at um, these questions you have to ask yourself. And my time is, is running fast because I wanted us to have discussion. How does the worldview influence a student's understanding of how this curriculum course or topic relates to his or her life, or faith, sorry, life within the particular cultural context and academic discipline. Because we have to think about all those. There's integration. If you want internalization, there must be integration. Otherwise, the knowledge will go into one of the compartments and be lost. What objectives should the educator incorporate in the curriculum, including the course outlines that challenge students to begin to contextualize? If you have a course syllabus that has nowhere on it that students need to contextualize or need to begin to try to understand whether it's a group project or whatever it is, then you're wasting your time. Contextualization will never take place on the pulpit because it hasn't taken place in the classroom. Does the course content uncover contextual issues that require reflective analysis? 
So that means you must know that target context in order to be able to uncover those issues that need discussion. One of the things I, I think we need to consider, which educational strategy is most effective in delivering the desired content? Think about Africa. Orality undergirds life in Africa. Most of us have been socialized in a context of orality. Even when we go abroad and we are traveling and you're lost, you, it's not your first instinct to look at a map. What's our first instinct? Ask somebody, how do I get to this place? Because orality is our foundation. So how are you teaching if you're not considering this aspect of orality? Contextualization goes even to the delivery of the course content. And you have to use videos, you have to use role plays, you have to use case studies, you have to use stories, and so on and so forth. The third point, the third principle that I think we need to look at as we move forward, create a dialogue between the biblical context and the target context. Paul did that very well with his audience. He made an effort to build bridges of communication. His first bridge, all right, I see that you are very religious. He looked at the idols and he didn't condemn them for idolatry, he complimented them on their commitment to religion. So when our students are in our classrooms, what do we do with those ideas that they have come in with? Do we tell them, forget that, that is evil, that is wrong, or not even engage it at all? Or do we try to create a dialogue? Every individual is situated within a cultural context and lives in general conformity to that context. And so if you're not engaging in dialogue with our students' cultural context, then we are going to lose. So you need to study that target culture. And you need to dialogue, for instance, through mother tongue translations. Let's say you're studying Genesis and you're reading Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So do you assume your students don't already have a concept of God, perhaps that's been corrupted by their concept of God that has come to them through their traditional understandings or their socialization. They already have something. And so we have to begin to engage. Sometimes mother tongue translations are very useful. The students use it for personal study, depending on the context you're in. Sometimes they use it for ministry. Right? Sometimes when my husband is training in the rural areas, he speaks in the mother tongue and some of them will have their mother tongue Bibles. And so this, this could be a way of beginning to create a dialogue for the students to see they have something valuable to bring to the table. Um, maybe they even have creation stories. Paul used a poem from um, his opponent's context to prove a point. So maybe they can come with their stories and you can have a dialogue about their creation stories but very, very importantly, you cannot get sucked into their worldview. Obviously, we understand that's not what we are going to do. We, in Genesis 1-1, you would show that that God in their creation stories is not the God that you are talking about, the same way that Paul, Paul did. If, or the debate, the dialogue can be around theological systems. Systematic theology, we use Grudem, we, we use, um, what's it, Erickson, and sometimes when we use those, I, I feel the lack because the section on angelology and demonology is, is so tiny, yet this is the issue that many of our Africans are dealing with. And not just, there, there are so many. Let me give you an example. In Kenya, there are what we call deliverance classes, two years. As a Christian, Christian, you go to those deliverance classes to be delivered from ancestral curses. It's a two-year program. And at the end of that, you are free. These are intelligent people, lawyers, doctors, pe people who can reason. What does that mean? We don't seem to understand what the cross means. But why don't we understand that? Why don't we understand that? And that, that, those are the questions that I have. All right, determine what is negotiable and what is non-negotiable. You're not going to accept everything that comes from your student's worldview. You have to allow the biblical worldview to confront them so that you can get to the right place. Some value systems of Africa have a positive correlation in the Bible. The value of family, the value of community. Why do we not, relationships, why do we not show the students how these are reflected in the Bible, but then give the students the right grounding
for the value of that community. It's because of our relationship with God through Christ. But use those positive aspects in our culture to begin to develop a practical theology that will actually work because it is what we know. It is what we are used to, but now we have given it a different foundation. I've pointed out there, to be, we need to be cautious because contextualization carries a very real danger of sliding into syncretism. And we need to avoid that at all costs. Um, when you mix your religious and cultural forms together, you come up with something that's not even Christianity. And I think that it's very important that we heed, uh, Kato in 1985 long ago said this, Africans need to formulate theological concepts in the language of Africa, but theology itself in its essence must be left alone. Theology broadly speaking now, not as a discipline. The Bible must remain the basic source of Christian theology. Evangelical Christians know of only one theology, biblical theology, though it may be expressed in the context of each cultural milieu. The problem right now is all the AICs that are blossoming have some syncretistic elements in them. And I don't know how we can bring those pastors into our institutions. So we cannot ignore the background of our students, the worldview of our students. You have to engage it. First of all, you have to know it. You have to engage it. And then you have to determine what is negotiable and what is not negotiable. And all this filters down to your curriculum, to your philosophy, to your learning objectives. It filters down to your course content. It filters down to your course delivery. Because that way you have engaged the student holistically. So what next as I come to the end? We've been talking a lot about sharing and I think that that's very important. Uh, before I go to sharing, training of faculty. Please don't be offended but I think we need to focus on homegrown faculty. Faculty trained on the continent for the continent. If you're coming to serve in Africa, it might not be a bad idea to get your MDiv here or your PhD here. It's not a bad idea. I've had students in some of the institutions I teach who have come in from the States. One of the benefits of that is you get the course content, but you engage with the students. You begin to understand these people that you're coming to serve. I think we can also <coughs> learn from best practices. There are some institutions that have understood how to contextualize well, and we can learn from them. We can share our resources, particularly um, our books that we have. We need to share those, because you may want to contextualize your curriculum, but you don't know how because you don't have the resources. Uh, we were talking yesterday that one of the things the ACTIA team always notices is that when you go to the library, the Africana section is very slim. So why not share? We're in here. Why, why can't we do library sharing of some kind? We need to be able to do that so that we can access them and we can be able to develop our curriculum. And then research, writing, and publishing. I think that as I close, Africans need to step up. I said the other, yesterday, the church is lopsided. We are not writing enough, and yet we have the creativity and we have the ability. So we need to begin to engage in research, in writing, and in publishing. And if the resources are not sufficient, then we talk and we get together and we figure out how to get the resources so that we can be able to have books that our students can actually use. Uh, in conclusion, I begin by reiterating that not only is the church in Africa on very precarious ground, the global church is as well, by virtue of the statistics cited. The ball is now in our court. We have to ensure that the church of the future is well grounded and that the faith and practice of its members conform to biblical truth. And we can only do that if we help our students begin to internalize what they're learning in the classroom. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, my assumption was that as we uh, use Paul and that text, we are recognizing that our ultimate goal is to bring our students to a biblical worldview through a proper understanding of the gospel, but I didn't say it. And so I think it would be important uh, to have that. Uh, that can come out in the philosophy of your curriculum. 
Uh, when you're designing a curriculum, you have all those different parts. And under the philosophy of the curriculum, that is where you talk about gospel-centeredness. Because we have to go deep into the gospel in order to remove, I mean, to reverse the trend that we are seeing. Thank you. That, that, that's a good point. Thank you. And one thing that I did not mention is that because the way Africa is changing, a curriculum that is even two years old is, is, is too old. Every two years, evaluation and revision must take place of the content, of the illustrations, of the teaching methodology. It's a lot of work. And what I was hoping is that with this group, when we talk about sharing of resources, we can put together those who are responsible for curriculum development in your institutions and have workshops together so that we can learn from each other how best to go about contextualizing our curriculum. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, don't get me wrong. Reinventing the wheel is, is not our purpose. You can look at a curriculum that has been designed for a different context and see what fits for you, especially for the head and maybe the hard part, and then begin to bring in your own contextualization as you look at the model because you know, there's no point starting afresh when people have tried and tested some of the curricula that they have. As to how long it takes, I can only speak from my own experience. Uh, it generally takes me about three months of total dedication. It's better if your curriculum developer is working with a team, a group of, you know, like a, a small committee of about four people who are helping with that. And um, for the Kenyan situation, our curriculum has to go through the Commission for University Education. So even if your curriculum is ready, it goes through that accreditation process. So by the end of the day, it takes about a year to have that curriculum uh, in, in your classroom. Contextualization, like I said, a very basic um, definition is making ideas and concepts relevant in a given situation. Now modernization, of course, is um, uh, outside, well, you can have that within contextualization because people are becoming modernized and globalized. But uh, technology that we, we, we are using now, um, the things that we experience within our urban uh, areas, everything that is moving us from the more traditional framework into a more globalized framework, that's what I would understand as modernization, the, especially with technology. But I think that with your question, you have to consider modernization when you're contextualizing because your audience is changing every day. And your youth is exposed, especially the younger generation, they're exposed to a lot of these outside influences every day of their lives. Exactly, that, that's excellent. Because if you just consider the worldview of the students and you forget where the students are going to serve, uh, then it becomes a problem because the student may not be well equipped. So definitely that, that's an excellent idea. And perhaps the only way to do that is to have the students themselves come in and tell you, uh, this is the kind of congregation I'm going back to. This is the kind of community I'm going back to. You can have them do some empirical research as well, uh, going out to their community to see what, what do they think, what is their worldview like. That way you have hard data. I'm all for the hard data to help us develop this curriculum. Thank you, that, that's actually very good.